This is Ghost Talk with 187 PI. Sit back and prepare yourselves for an adventure into the paranormal world with host Shelly Robertson and 187 PI Research Team. Ghost Talk is broadcasting live from Ohio's most haunted jail. Listen as they delve into the history of the old and haunted Paulding County Jail, where some of the residents still live within its walls. Learn about their ongoing research at the jail and abroad, investigation techniques, and their personal encounters. Here is your host of Ghost Talk and 187 PI founder, Shelly Robertson. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Ghost Talk Radio. We have a fantastic and interesting show planned for you tonight. So make sure you're all logged into chat at letstalkradio.net. Tonight's co-host is Rhonda Merkel, and we will be discussing paranormal conspiracy theories. Hello and welcome, Rhonda. Hello, everyone. So happy to be here tonight. Uh, I know. It's good to have you back. Okay, folks, I have to start things off like this tonight. The topic of discussion tonight is very controversial. We, as well as all of you, our listening friends out there tonight, may have different beliefs and opinions, which that's okay. Everyone is entitled to their own beliefs and opinions. Even if you don't agree with ours, we're good with it. We still love you all and respect your opinions, and we'd like to hear those thoughts. So come on into chat at letstalkradio.net and tell us, because who knows? You might be able to sway us to your side of the fence. So let's start off with talking a little bit about what a conspiracy theory is. Now, this is a broad spectrum, and it covers all conspiracy theories, not just paranormal ones. It is a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for circumstances or events They are generally secret plots that are largely unknown to the general public. Now, there's just tons of conspiracy theories in which they may or may not be true. However, you'll find that there are thousands of people who will swear by the truth of some of these conspiracy theories. There may be some of them that are just made up with no lick of truth to them at all. But you'll have people who still swear by the truth of them. Now, we have some great friends that actually do believe in some of the conspiracy theories that we will be discussing tonight, in which we don't believe. Nonetheless, they are fabulous people and great friends of ours. So, with having said all of this, let's just jump right into some of the most interesting conspiracy theories. Many tonight will be revolving around paranormal. Rhonda, what is the first conspiracy theory that comes to your mind? Well, it's the one, the only, Mr. Bigfoot. (laughs) Oh my goodness. There is a ton of conspiracy theories on Bigfoot. Oh yes. Here are just a few of the top conspiracy theories. The first one is... A DNA test proved that Bigfoot is a part human hybrid and deserves U.S. citizenship. Oh, my gosh. And if that's the case, he could get a passport. And then, folks, we could get a nice, clear photo of Mr. Bigfoot. So, by all means, give him U.S. citizenship. (laughs) (laughs) A second one is the government secretly removed burnt Sasquatch corpses from Mount St. Helens after the, the 1980 eruption. I remember the when that actually happened. Then we have Bigfoot is really a caveman. Wow. Next, we have the one that states Bigfoot is really an alien. Okay. A UFO researcher, Stan Gordon, out of Pennsylvania, stated that there is an increase in sightings of Bigfoot entering and exiting extraterrestrial vessels. Stan was so fascinated by the possibilities that the mysterious primates may actually hail from another planet 
that he set up a Bigfoot UFO hotline that still operates to this day. Okay, so everyone out there, if you happen to see Bigfoot getting on or getting off an alien spaceship, it is imperative that you call Stan Gordon's UFO Anomaly Zone. It's a 24-hour UFO hotline at phone number. Take this down, y'all. 724-838-7768. You can also go to his website and report your sighting at stangordon.info. However, I feel you will get much quicker action if you make that call. And by all means, snap some photos, but you better be quick. Because another conspiracy theory by many Bigfoot enthusiasts, they claim the reason they don't have any photos is because Mr. Bigfoot has a cloaking mechanism that allows him to disappear whenever people show up in the woods. Wow. And let me tell you how he does it. Bigfoot can vibrate his body at such speeds that it distorts the light around him, causing him to appear invisible. Others claim his translucent hair reflects light like a mirror. Coupled with his dark skin, these reflective hairs blend him into the scenery, much like a special op sniper. Whoa, wow. that's so incredible. <laughs> that's why we have no clear photos. Well, according to James Bobo Fay, there is a special call that you can do to make Bigfoot come running. Is that right? That's right. And he has demonstrated this call. However, he has no pictures himself of Bigfoot because he says that when he saw Bigfoot, which he claims to have seen him multiple times. Oh, yes, I saw that too. He didn't have any camera equipment. He states he has seen several of them many times and says the Bigfoot is like its own species with 1,500 to 6,000 Bigfoots living in the world right that now. That is just fascinating. Rhonda. His call was so unique, <laughs> much like a screaming monster man. <laughs> How about you demonstrate the Bigfoot call for us? <laughs> I will tone it down a little bit because it's loud. And I don't want to blow you all out of here because I've been practicing this. <laughs> for the next time, I'm in the woods with Rob deer hunting to see if I can get Mr. Bigfoot to come running. Okay. So here it goes, everyone. This is the call of the adult male. Ooh. <laughs> okay. And with that, let's talk about this Bigfoot DNA evidence. There's a huge story behind this, okay? However, we're going to go straight to the nuts and bolts of it. There's a lady by the name of Melba S. Ketchum. Now, she had a DNA diagnostics lab where she supposedly did a DNA test on samples such as hair, blood, and tissue that was given to her reportedly coming from a Bigfoot. Wow. So they had tissue and got no photo. That's, That's crazy. Yes. Now, she even had, though, a video that was supposedly leaked of a sleeping Bigfoot, specifically was said the Bigfoot was female and its name was Matilda. Now, Rhonda and I watched this video. Yes, let, you did. Uh -huh. let me just say, if you were close enough to film a live sleeping Bigfoot, wouldn't you make sure you got a shot of its face? Absolutely. I mean, this video looked like a big hunk of crapper, you know, <laughs> like you get to make costumes out of. I, it is in no way did it look like real fur coming from something living. Um, the video was shoddy. I mean... There were close-up views with no facial, nothing. Okay, so anyways, nonetheless, it looked like a big chunk of craft fur. Now, the result from her published paper from the DNA test, it took forever to come to fruitation. There were delays for one circumstance or another, basically... It was resulting in her whole testing being a farce. She was tied to many controversial people and projects. And so after she had so much criticism, she finally did get this paper out. 
and the people involved were forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Isn't that fascinating? That's just interesting. Now, there's this researcher from Princeton University. He stated after reading her paper, which all the scientists there agreed that it was unimpressive, that the Bigfoot DNA test results come back as either 100% human or it failed in ways of technical artifacts. Now, me personally, this is my personal opinion, I haven't seen a Bigfoot. I haven't seen any hard proof evidence of a Bigfoot. No clear pictures, videos, nothing. So I really don't think there's a Bigfoot. I mean, it would be cool, but seriously, folks, if there were Bigfoot running around, living in the wilderness, there would be a ton of evidence, such as sleeping sites, fecal droppings, evidence of feeding, and the list goes on. And, well, there is just nothing. How do you feel about Bigfoot, Rhonda? Now, the research I have done on Bigfoot, there has been no real evidence that even remotely suggests that they exist. But we have open minds, and it would be awesome if there was a Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, I will tell you. I will have to say this, though. While the two of us do not believe in Bigfoot, we're skeptical, we do have a couple members in our 187PI research group Yes. Who do, in fact, believe Bigfoot exists, one of which is Rob Tremel, and he does spend a lot of time outdoors in the woods. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, there's been some recent reported sightings. So, Rob and Toby are planning a Bigfoot hunt right now, and they will be going and doing this this summer to try to locate him. Now, I hope they are successful in obtaining some pictures or video evidence. Rhonda and I, we do have open minds, and we're prepared to eat our words if they're yes, successful. <laughs> if anyone listening tonight has an opinion on Bigfoot, pop on into our interactive chat at letstalkradio.net. Tell us about it. We would love to hear your opinion. Have you seen Bigfoot? Do you have a clear shot photo? Come on in and tell us about it. Yes, everyone. Pop on into chat. Yeah. There is another conspiracy theory surrounding the oarfish. Oh, okay. This oarfish, which can grow to over 30 feet in length, is said to resemble a serpent. With a small mouth, because, you know, they eat plankton, they are deep-sea creatures that live 3,300 feet below the surface of the ocean and rarely are found at the surface. Interesting. It is said that when they are spotted near the surface, they are relaying a message from the sea gods in regards to a coming earthquake. Ah. This earthquake theory goes back many, many years coming from Japan. You know, this conspiracy theory on this one, it has yet to be fully verified due to the fact that more research needs to be conducted. But I do believe some kind of earth vibrations could send them to the surface. Now, I don't know about the sea gods sending the message, but I have seen photos of the fish, and they're very big and kind of ugly. They are. <laughs> and I believe vibrations could send them to the top. What do you think, Rama? I would have to say that they really, the fish could really be a possibility, mm -hmm. but I just, there's not enough research to support if they're really bringing, you know, that there's going to be a future earthquake. Or right, right. So, I tell you what, let's move on to this spooky conspiracy theory on the black-eyed children. There have been reported sightings on these black-eyed children since the late 1990s. They are supposedly children between the ages of 9 and 13 years old, and they have some pretty distinguishing looks to them. They are said to be very pale skin, and of course, they have completely black eyes. They've been seen wearing hoodies, they're only seen at night, and it said they wind up on people's doorsteps asking unsuspecting homeowners for help, like to use the phone or the bathroom, so they can come on into your home, <laughs> because it said that they cannot come in unless they are invited to come in. Now, alleged sightings actually are taken seriously by some ghost hunters. Yes, they are. Some of whom believe the black-eyed children to be extraterrestrials, vampires, or ghosts. We here at 187 PI do not fall into this category. It is reported that if you let these black-eyed children into your home, 
You may experience mysterious unexplained illnesses and they may even result in unexplained deaths. This conspiracy theory actually started around 1998 and actually two entities, one of which is large, large started this urban legend or conspiracy theory. One was by a guy named Brian Scott, who claimed to have had an experience with a black-eyed children, after which he went and posted the encounter to a ghost-related mailing list oh. telling all about the incident. Then, of course, many accounts by other people soon followed. Oh, I'm sure. The other entity responsible for creating the sensational theory was by MSN. Uh-huh. Now, after they posted a two-minute video on the black-eyed children to their entertainment section of the website. Wow. Which actually coincided with the release of the black-eyed kids, an urban legend horror-based film. Now, I didn't see that film myself. No, I didn't either. But I, I do believe, you know, <coughs> excuse me. Accounts came flooding in, and many people did claim to have encountered the black-eyed children. You know, I myself have not come across any real hard evidence of any of these claims. I have found no real photos. We only actually have witness accounts. In my opinion, black-eyed children is just that, an urban legend. Rhonda, what do you think of the black-eyed children? I think about the same thing as I do with Bigfoot. I have no real proof. So until I do, this is an urban legend for me. Well. Yeah, yeah. There is actually another widely publicized and controversial conspiracy theory on the shape-shifting lizard humanoid people, also known as reptilians. The main goal of the reptilian population is world domination. My favorite, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they try to gain world domination by infiltrating many of our top government and social positions. According to a well-known author and most prominent theorist of the reptilian shapeshifters, David Icke, it is believed that these reptilians come from the constellation Draco. Draco being the constellation that is shaped like a dragon with the Latin name of Draconum, which actually means huge serpent, it's the eighth largest constellation. Now, these reptilians could also come from systems like um, Sirius, Orion, um, category, basically, as aliens. The theories about these reptilian shapeshifters are vast, and there is just tons of speculated information. So just to touch a few, according to David Icke, uh -huh. The cold-blooded reptilians have the power to shapeshift into the human form. He even claims that creatures are behind the secret societies like the Freemasons and the Illuminati. Interesting. It is believed that some people may even be possessed by the reptilians, which enables them to take on their human form. Hmm. Other theories suggest that these shape-shifting reptilians have mated with the human race, planting their DNA to make it easier to take over the person. And you know what? There are some common characteristics of shape-shifting oh, yes, reptilians. It is said many of them have green eyes and red hair. So all you green eyes, red hair <laughs> folks out there, you could actually be part of the reptilian race. It said they have good eyesight, good hearing, they have a sense of not belonging to the human race. They may have unexplained scars on their body and low blood pressure. They may have um, abnormally large sized pupils and they frequently smile showing their bottom teeth. <laughs> That's a little bizarre. Yes. They are thought to be tall. There is a huge list of people in charge on a government level and in Hollywood that theorists believe are shapeshifters. Just to name a few are George Bush, the royal family of England, Rihanna, Jennifer Lopez, and Justin Bieber. And believe me, there are many, many more. Absolutely. There are just tons of photos and videos that theorists have posted showing where these people shapeshift. 
which to me actually looks much like pixelation or camera glitches and maybe even weird lighting reflections. There was even a poll taken by public policy polling back in 2013. This polling organization found that 4% of the people polled believed in lizard people, while another 7% said they were unsure. Now to put this 4% into perspective, people, that's equal to 12 million people. That's just amazing to me. (laughs) that there's that many people who believe in this conspiracy theory. I find it kind of far-fetching myself. While I do entertain the idea that there may be life forms out there, such as aliens from different planets and, you know, dimensions, this shape-shifting theory is just a little hard for me to choke down. And with that, folks, we'll be right back after this short break with more Ghost Talk. You're listening to WGOGDB. Of all the radio stations in the world, we're one of them. WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Let's talk. It's safe to say that we are not alone in the universe. Most of us believe in the existence of intelligent life elsewhere. But where are they? With over 19 years of extensive research, author, investigator, and ufologist Tom Conwell can only provide one answer. They are here. A series of books like no other that contains compelling evidence of UFOs on the East Coast. Volume 1. In the Central United States. Volume 2. And the Western U.S. Volume 3. Not only has Tom written about these sightings in his book series, but also painstakingly documented each report on a -a one-of-a-kind UFO sighting map of the entire United States. Could the eyewitness reports of thousands of people be wrong? Read Tom Conwell's They Are Here series and decide for yourself. They have eluded us. They have traveled far. They are here. Order your proof today at theyarehere-conwell.com that's theyarehere-conwell.com Terry Lovelace is a 64-year-old retired lawyer and former assistant attorney general. The earliest alien experience Terry can recall was when he was eight years old. Incident at Devil's Den. In May of 1963, he saw a UFO and described it as a perfect silver disc. Three years later, on a clear night, he saw a second flying disc outside his second-story bedroom window. Incident at Devil's Den. In 1975, While serving as a medic in the Air Force, he witnessed yet another UFO hovering 50 feet over an ICBM missile silo. Incident at Devil's Den. Two years later, while he and a friend were camped in an isolated state park known as Devil's Den, Terry had a life-changing fourth encounter. Not only did Terry and a friend witness an estimated five-story high UFO, but this fourth encounter would be an epic, life-altering event. Incident at Devil's Den by Terry Lovelace. Digital download or paperback now available on Amazon. In a world of many voices, there's just one that needs to be heard. Yours. Join the conversation at Let's Talk Radio.net. Twenty three minutes past the hour. Welcome back to Ghost Talk Radio with me, Shelley Robertson, as your host. If you have just tuned in, to Tonight, um, I'm joined with Rhonda Merkel, and we have been discussing the different types of conspiracy theories. If you missed the first half of the show, no worries. You can catch the archives at your leisure at letstalkradio.net or on Speaker, iTunes, Google Play, or iHeartRadio. We invite everybody to share your opinions with us tonight in our live chat at letstalkradio.net. And be sure to post any questions you might have for us in all capital letters. 
So we've been talking about conspiracy theories, ranging from Bigfoot to shapeshifters. Now I want to get into some other ones tonight that are just fascinating to me. They are conspiracy theories that have been going around for decades. So grab your tinfoil hats, folks. It's time to get a little paranoid because the government has been controlling your mind. That's right. The telepathic ray gun. Research brought to you by the U.S. Army. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) They have a special device utilizing microwave. According to a recent declassified 1998 document released under the U.S. Freedom of Information Act, this device could be words right into your skull. Oh, boy. So they could essentially control what you hear in your head. This special microwave ray gun can, have, can also cause people to have heart attacks and epileptic seizures, which may be used for crowd control. That's right, everyone. So maybe all those disembodied voices you think you hear during your ghost hunt, it's actually the government using the telepathic ray gun in your general (laughs) vicinity. Another bizarre conspiracy theory. Unsuspecting people who are psychic, clairvoyant, mediums, and others who have special abilities are being watched and targets of secret experiments all being done without their knowledge. Brought to you by the U.S. government. Don't believe it? Well, folks, it is indeed true. The U.S. government has been doing paranormal research and experiments dating as far back as 1860, all of which is verified through the government's own declassified reports many of which have been released for public viewing under the U.S. Freedom of Information Act. So, all you paranormal skeptics out there, get ready to be mind-blown because our U.S. government has been allocating millions of dollars into paranormal research with experiment labs all across the United States. They find many of these experiments to be a success which causes them to continue the research. So your tax dollar skeptics has been funding this venture. If there was nothing to the paranormal, as you skeptics believe, hang on to your tinfoil caps, because not only is our government doing the research, they are in a psychic's arms race with the USSR and China. Believe that. I must believe it. There is a well-known government project That was launched in the United States by the CIA called MKUltra. Now, we have condensed this by a lot. The MKUltra project in its entirety was a huge project. Oh my goodness, yes. With a ton of sub-projects under this. So, basically, short and sweet, this experiment project focused heavily on mind control and to alter and manipulate human mental states and consciousness. Uh Often with the help of a generous portions of chemicals and hallucinogenic drugs, such as LSD, barbiturates, amphetamines, and weed. Yes, weed, just to name a few. All these drugs were used in an effort to create a master drug that would be used for mind control and to to develop a truth serum. All of this was done in hopes of creating the perfect assassin or spy that could be activated when they needed it. That is absolutely fascinating. And we do have a question from Brenda Holmes in chat. And she says, so when will they share this evidence? Brenda, it's available right now. Go to the CIA website and go to the reading room. There's like 20,000 declassified documents on this MK Ultra project. And there's like, oh my gosh, thousands (laughs) upon thousands under the class of uh, Stargate. The Stargate files, those have tons of the paranormal research that the government has been doing. And it's been going back for literally decades and decades, and you can read all of this. They've been declassified. Now, a few articles, they'll scrub out some names or whatnot, but 
It's all the government yes. research files, and it is there. Now, what is mind-blowing about the MK Ultra project is that it was secretly ran in many institutions, such as prisons, hospitals, mental health facilities, and even colleges. Mm -hmm. These experiments were even performed on people who were either friends of or acquaintances of the researchers themselves. Oh my gosh. The researchers themselves. And they would do these experiments on some of those people who would attend those social events like their party and stuff. You go to a friend's <laughs> party and you're being drugged, you know? And the crazy thing of it is, these institutions were aware of what was going on, and literally thousands upon thousands of dollars was funding experiments and the institution, which much of that money coming from the CIA. So now you may be wondering, well, how does this tie into the paranormal, this mind control? Well, I'm going to tell you. The MK Ultra project, it had many sub-projects, like over 150 oh, sub-projects, okay? One of which was called MK Often, which was also referred to as MK Chickwit. This particular sub-project set its focus of research well beyond mind control and incapacitation of enemies, and it branched out into black magic, witchcraft, and occult. So yes, wow. they are they are researching that too. <laughs> Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, he was the chief of the CIA's technical service branch at this time, and he was known as the black sorcerer due to his expertise in poisons, and he used this program to explore the world of black magic and harness the forces of darkness and challenge the concept that inner reaches of the mind were on beyond reach, you know. Yeah. I'll tell you, as a part of this operation often, which was mind blowing to me by the way, Absolutely. Dr. Gottlieb and other CIA employees, they visited with and recruited fortune tellers, palm readers, clairvoyants, astrologists, medium psychics, specialists in demonology, witches and warlocks, Basically, anyone who was an occult practitioner, they recruited and they even approached in 1972, they even approached a monsignor in charge of exorcisms for the Catholic Archdiocese of New York, which this monsignor, he refused to cooperate. Actually, yes. in 1962, Stephen Aldridge took over the operation who was working for the Office of Research and Development, and by May 1971, Operation Often had three astrologer, astrologers on its payroll yes. whose specific task was to predict the future. Predict the future. We're paying them to predict the future. By 1972, Two Chinese American palmists have been employed to probe how hand reading could be developed for intelligence work. Uh huh. Research was being conducted into black magic. The Scientific Engineering Institute funded a course in sorcery at the University of South Carolina. You know, I'm going to tell you about this, everyone, because this is kind of mind blowing it too. Is. Um, there is this investigative journalist and researcher by the name of Alex Constantine who also wrote a pursuits that were carried out by the program um, claiming that the CIA was interested in starting religious cults and this was in order to look into more mind control and human behavior mm -hmm. what's ironic about this is at the time this project was going on there was a rise in the occult here in the United States, and the Church of Satan was actually established in San Francisco at this time. Not only during the MK Often project, in 1966, when it was at its peak, mm -hmm. and the CIA was researching the occult and black magic, um, Parker Brothers, they reintroduced the Ouija board. Wow. We also saw the premieres of Star Trek, Dark Shadows, and Batman during that time, too. 
Well, so, you know, on August 1st of that year, 1966, uh-huh. former Marine Charles Whitman killed 14 and wounded 32 from a tower at the University of Texas in Austin in one of the first modern mass shooting events. Before the shootings, Whitman would write, I don't quite understand what is compelling me to type this note. Huh. I have been to a psychiatrist. I have been having fears and violent impulses. The University of Texas, get this, was one of the institutions involved in NK Ultra research. Yeah, that's just fascinating coincidence, right? Now, that same year, 1966, get this, folks, the serial killer Richard Speck, he murders eight student nurses in Chicago. Then that's exactly when the Zodiac killings began. And JFK's brain is discovered missing from the National Archives. Wow. We also saw major UFO waves, you know, sightings Mm -hmm. in eastern Massachusetts. Now, are all these things coincidence? Or are they products of the MK Ultra and MK Often Pro- projects, you know, the government? Yes. Are they behind all these? You can be the judge on that one, folks. I kind of think, you know, it's especially the Texas killing yes. at the university. Yes. I seriously think they were behind That's that. Just <laughs> now, the next conspiracy theory is that the CIA is using psychics as espionage experts for their covert operations. In fact, folks, please hold on to your wallets because the CIA has actually invested over $20 million. You might not think it, you know, $20 million, okay, whatever, you know, the deficit is into the gazillions, you know. Yes. (laughs) But this $20 million is back through 1975. Oh so, my gosh. So that was a whole lot of yes. money back there. Now, they were researching ESP and other psychic phenomena, all right? Um, the paranormal skeptics, I want you to think about this. With our country running in the red as far as national deficit is concerned, because if you think they've stopped these programs, think again. That's all right. right. The government believes that working out millions of dollars in paranormal research and researching psychic abilities will, in fact, give our country an advantage in global intelligence in such ways like locating missile bases in Moscow or seeing where some military troops are of other countries we're at war with. You know, and it's interesting. That's very. Our government has knowledge that paranormal is indeed a valid option. Think about that. Or they wouldn't be keeping at it, you know? Which brings us to the CIA research in geomagnetic geomagnetic factors in spontaneous, subjective, telepathic, precognitive, and post-mortem experiences. I know, folks, you heard me right. (laughs) post-mortem, and that sure was a mouthful, but that's after death, that's, you know, that's, just that's hard to swallow, that that it is, out. now this research has been going on for a very long time, the first set was conducted from 1868 to 1884, and the next set was conducted from 1920 to 1967, they had three to find out how geomagnetic activity affected each class. The three classes were subjective telepathic, was the first one, Mm -hmm. precognitive, was the second one, and postmortem was the third one. More than 98% of the cases involved episodes of sudden death, crisis, or illness to friends and family members. Think about that. We have another question in chat from Brenda. Okay. She says, so are they spending the discord in the paranormal community right now? Are they spreading the The discord in the paranormal community right now? Well, I don't know if they're, I mean, these just got 
declassified not too long yes. ago. And I, from the looks of some of these documents, I don't think they've ever stopped this. And of course, just like the UFOs, they try to keep everything quiet, you know? I don't think they're. I don't. Yeah, I think they're, I think they're just. Yeah. No, they're just keeping everything quiet. What they were able to determine through all this research was that telepathic experiences occurred on days when the geomagnetic activity was much less than on the days that precognitive or postmortem experiences occurred. In addition to this, the geomagnetic activity on the days of the telepathic experiences were significantly lower than the days before or after the experiences and for the month and year in which the experiences occurred. So, telepathic experiences always occurred when the geomagnetic activity was at low levels. Uh -huh. The case results of the three classes were also reported in Fate magazine. Now, isn't that just fascinating? Which, by the way, everyone... Stick around after the show tonight because Fate Radio is coming up next with host Todd Bates, and he has a fantastic show planned for you tonight. Many first-person reported cases in the three classes that we just discussed, you know, that, that contain the date, month, year yes. of the experiences, those were actually obtained from the Fate Magazine Library. Interesting. Yes, they were able to use these as they had a way to measure the geomagnetic activity over the years because they had records dating back to the 1860s on the monograph or on magnetic tape. You know, during this experiment project, they also found that certain psychic occurrences were associated by certain times of day. That's example, interesting. This research actually really helps us yes, so we know when does. to look for things. For example, you know, dreams and apparitional experiences were most likely to occur between midnight and 6 a.m. Interesting. Impressions and images were most likely to occur between the hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Reports of the specific times of the experiences did not differ between the three classes of phenomena. So when they all had these certain experiences, they all fell into those time yes. slots. That's, that's really interesting. Now, it was found that increased geomagnetic activity contributed to the postmortem experiences, which those were mainly postmortem apparitions and they would occur within three days of the death. Actually, the CIA had a regimen on how to conduct a paranormal investigation with an outline of basic research tasks to be performed. Now, this outline has been declassified and released for public viewing under the U.S. Freedom of Information Act. If you are interested in seeing the regimen... Which is cool. You can find the document at the CIA website. Go to the reading room and, you know, you can find all of them. Just type in Stargate. It, everything's it's under the Stargate yes. files. Yeah. And um, many of a bunch of other paranormal uh, research that they conducted can be found there, too. Now, they are, they are said, this next one, it's an interesting conspiracy theory, and it's the men in black. They are said to be men dressed in all black, and they show up at reported alien sightings, and they try to intimidate <coughs> and silence the people or witnesses from releasing the information about the sightings. The first reported account of the men in black happened in June of 1947. That's a long time back. That is a long time ago. By a, name, by a man named Harold Dahl. Uh -huh. He was out on his boat in Washington State when he saw six giant donut-shaped donut objects in the sky. One of the objects fell apart, spilling debris that killed his dog and injured his son. Oh, my. He took photos of the debris... But they were fogged over because he was told by men in black to not speak of the incident. 
That is just fascinating. I'll tell you, there had the first photo snapped of the men in black was in 1968 um, by a UFO researcher and his wife. Then we had uh, the first video was in 2008 of the men in black, and that was in Niagara Falls at a hotel near Niagara Falls. So people actually did capture photographs, and I've seen some of them, and it yes. just it looks just like that, you know? Absolutely. I think that the government would absolutely have a secret task force that would be guarding these sightings, you know? I think the government could absolutely have a task force that tries to keep, you know, the sightings out of the mainstream media, much absolutely. like the cover-up of many of the other projects the government has been involved in. Absolutely. And with that, folks, we will be right back after this short break with more Ghost Talk. You're listening to Ghost Talk Radio and WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Real people and not pre-recorded and regurgitated radio. WGOG DB Clearwater. Let's talk. Coming soon with your support. Preacher Six is a small town preacher that is summoned to the big city where he ends up finding evil in a literal sense. The characters that he meets along the journey are something special and unique. They could all have their own films made about them. If you like original content that is driven by action and amazing writing, you must support the film Preacher Six. No remakes, redos, sequels, or do-overs for us. Let's take film. Back. If you like Quentin Tarantino type films, then you will love Preacher 6. Preacher 6 is like Taxi Driver meets Sin City meets The Prophecy. So please be a part of something awesome. Sometimes darkness just needs a few well placed bullets. Preacher 6. Support this new film at Indiegogo.com and search Preacher 6. That's Indiegogo.com, Preacher 6. Support it and let's take film back. In 2012, Keith Linder, after successfully obtaining a management position at a prestige healthcare company, decides the time is right for him and his girlfriend to move in together. That's putting things lightly. Weird things begin to happen within days of moving into the modern suburban home. The horrors they witnessed and desperately tried to fight off would end up putting them at the odds with members of the paranormal community and themselves. This gripping story told from the house occupant's point of view not only lists tales, but also includes pictures, video reenactments, commentary, and audio of the events being reported. Author Keith Linder does not ask you to believe him. He only asks you to listen. The Bothell Hell House by Keith Linder, now available on Amazon. The book, The Bothell Hell House, the author, Keith Linder. Order yours today on Amazon. While the other stations are run from high-rises in the city, we're programmed from a little bungalow on Wintry Drive. Forty-eight minutes past the hour. Welcome back to Ghost Talk Radio with me, Shelly Robertson, as your host. And joining me tonight is Brenda or uh, Rhonda Merkel. I don't know why I called someone else from because I was reading chat. Um, <laughs> who's also a member of the One Eight Seven PI Research Team. If you have just tuned in, we've been discussing paranormal conspiracy theories. Don't worry though. If you missed the first part of the show. You can listen to the show archive at your leisure at letstalkradio.net or on speaker, iTunes, Google Play, or iHeartRadio. We invite you all to always, always join us in chat. 
Tell us your opinions at letstalkradio.net. And if you have a question for us, type them all in capital letters. Now I'll tell you, this next conspiracy theory is pretty controversial. And um, I want to reiterate that some people will still believe a conspiracy theory to be true, even if it is not, which everyone is entitled to their own opinion. This next one is brought to you by Hasbro, the one and only Ouija board. Using one will conjure up demonic entities. Okay, folks. The Ouija, also known as the spirit board or talking board, is a flat board marked with the letters of the alphabet. The numbers 0 through 9, the words yes, no, hello, goodbye, along with various symbols and graphics, it uses a small heart-shaped piece of wood or plastic called a planchette. Participants place their fingers on the planchette and players take turns asking questions and then wait to see what the planchette spells out for them. Following its commercial introduction by businessman Elijah Bond on July 1, 1890, the Ouija board was regarded as a parlor game unrelated to the occult until American spiritualist Pearl Curran popularized its use as divining tool during World War I. Spiritualists believed that the dead were able to contact the living and reported, reportedly used a talking board very similar to a modern Ouija board at their camps in Ohio in 1886 to enable communication with the spirits. Yes, and you know what? Practically, since its invention nearly a century ago, mainstream Christian religions, including Catholics, have warned us against the use of Ouija boards, claiming that they are a means of dabbling in Satanisms and they can lead to demonic possession. Now, in the scientific world, the Ouija phenomenon is considered to be the result of the ideometer response. What is the ideomotor response? Well, I'll tell you. It is a psychological phenomenon where a person makes motions unconsciously in a process where a thought or mental image brings about seemingly, you know, a reflex. It's kind of like automatic muscular reaction, and it's often in such a minuscule degree. This um, is exactly how this Ouija board works, yes. you know? Yep. There's a simple explanation for how the Ouija board works. It's not ghosts. But how you feel about that. Absolutely. That's that's really, you know, good. people have the idea of the pointer swooping around the board. Yes. Maybe they think of it because they want it to happen or because they're afraid it will. You're right. Those thoughts prime your hands unconsciously, almost irresistibly, to make the first twitch. Uh-huh. Once the movement begins, the excitement and drama build up. Next thing you know, everyone is asking the question, who's moving it? I'm not. Are you? Making everyone all the more susceptible to ideomotor movements and all the more unaware that they're making them. Now, I'll tell you. Me and Rhonda, we both play with this board up here and we have absolutely nothing happened. And so we're going on the scientific effects. Yes. And so we're going to just leave it at that. Yep. Y'all can believe it, but nothing ever happened with it us. With us no. So let's go over some of the things that are going on at the jail here the rest of the month. <laughs> Everyone listening tonight, we invite you to keep your eyes on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page this summer as Rob and Toby will be going on their Bigfoot hunting expedition and we will be filming the hunt in hopes of capturing a sighting, and we will share it all with you. Some items of interest next weekend, April 27th and 28th, we have our first public ghost hunt here, put on and organized by Ghost Hunt Weekends. If you're interested in coming to a ghost hunt and catching some of this activity, go to ghosthuntweekends.com and click on the Old Paulding County Jail. 
Now, the beginning of May, we have 187 Construction Company coming up for the escape games, which do help fund the restoration projects here at the jail. Coming up this week on Let's Talk Radio are some fantastic shows, and just to name a few, Sunday night, 8 p.m., we have Gang of Girls Radio with host Ariel Grace. Monday nights, we have Surviving Evidence with host Krista Cesare. Tuesday nights at 9 p.m., we have Haunted Voices Radio with Todd Bates. Wednesdays at 8 p.m., we have Paranormal Experience with Coast Cat Hobson. All are fantastic shows, oh, and I listen to them personally. I wish to thank all of you folks out there for listening to our live broadcast tonight. Be sure to stick around for Fate Radio coming up next with host Todd Bates. He has a great show planned for you tonight. Tune in next week for more Ghost Talk at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central at letstalkradio.net. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.